Hello, my name is Trace. I'm from the state of Kansas within the United States. I would like to introduce to you this channel consisting of English with a subtitle. The Good Earth by Pearl S. Buck from 1892 to 1973. Chapter 1. It was Wang Lung's marriage day at first opening his eyes in the blackness of the curtains about his bed. He could not think why the dawn seemed different from any other. The house was still except for the faint gasping cough of his old father whose room was opposite to his own across the middle room. Every morning the old man's cough was the first sound to be heard. Wang Lung usually lay listening to it, and moved only when he heard it approaching nearer and when he heard the door of his father's room squeak upon its wooden hinges. But this morning he did not wait. He sprang up and pushed aside the curtains of his bed. It was a dark, ruddy dawn, and through a small square hole of a window, where the tattered paper fluttered, a glimpse of bronze sky gleamed. He went to the hole and tore the paper away. It is spring, and I do not need this, he muttered. He was ashamed to say aloud that he wished the house to look neat on this day. The hole was barely large enough to admit his hand, and he thrust it out to feel of the air. A small soft wind blew gently from the east, a wind mild and full of rain. It was a good omen. The fields needed rain for fruition. There would be no rain this day, but within a few days, if this wind continued, there would be water. It was good. Yesterday he had said to his father that if this brazen glittering sunshine continued, the wheat could not fill in the ear. Now it was as if heaven had chosen this day to wish him well. Earth would bear fruit. He hurried out into the middle room, drawing on his blue outer trousers as he went, and nodding about the fullness at his waist, his girdle of blue cotton cloth. He left his upper body bare until he had heated water to bathe himself. He went into the shed, which was the kitchen. The kitchen was made of earthen bricks. This day he would bathe his whole body. Not since he was a child upon his mother's knee had anyone looked upon his body. Today one would, and he would have it clean. He went around the oven to the rear, and selecting a handful of dry grass and stalks standing in the corner of the kitchen, he arranged it delicately in the mouth of the oven, making the most of every leaf. Then from an old flint and iron he caught a flame and thrust it into the straw and there was a blaze. This was the last morning he would have to light the fire. He had lit it every morning since his mother died six years before. He had lit the fire, boiled the water, and poured the water into a bowl and taken it into the room where his father sat upon his bed, coughing and fumbling for his shoes upon the floor. Every morning for these six years, the old man had waited for his son to bring in hot water to ease him of his morning coughing. Now father and son could rest. There was a woman coming to the house. Never again would Wang Lung have to rise summer and winter at dawn to light the fire. He could lie in his bed and wait, and he also would have a bowl of water brought to him and if the earth were fruitful, there would be tea leaves in the water. And if the woman wearied, there would be her children to light the fire, the many children she would bear to Wang Lung. Wang Lung stopped, struck by the thought of children running in and out of their three rooms. The blaze of the oven died down while Wang Lung thought of all the beds there would be in the half-empty house and the water began to chill in the cauldron. The shadowy figure of the old man appeared in the doorway, holding his unbuttoned garments about him. He was coughing and spitting, and he gasped. 
How is it that there is not water yet to heat my lungs? Wang Lung stared and recalled himself and was ashamed. This fuel is damp, he muttered from behind the stove. The damp wind. The old man continued to cough perseveringly and would not cease until the water boiled. Wang Long dipped some into a bowl and then, after a moment, he opened a glazed jar that stood upon the ledge of the stove and took from it a dozen or so of the curled dried leaves and sprinkled them upon the surface of the water. The old man's eyes opened greedily and immediately he began to complain. Why are you so wasteful? Tea is like eating silver. It is the day, replied Wang Lung with a short laugh. Eat and be comforted. The old man grasped the bowl in his shriveled knotty fingers, muttering, uttering little grunts. He watched the leaves uncurl and spread upon the surface of the water, unable to bear drinking the precious stuff. It will be cold, said Wang Lung. True, true, said the old man in alarm, and he began to take great gulps of the hot tea. He passed into an animal satisfaction like a child fixed upon its feeding. But he was not too forgetful to see Wang Lung dipping the water recklessly from the cauldron into a deep wooden tub. He lifted his head and stared at his son. Now there is water enough to bring a crop to fruit, he said suddenly. Wang Lung continued to dip the water to the last drop. He did not answer. Now then, cried his father loudly, I have not washed my body all at once since the new year, said Wang Lung in a low voice. He was ashamed to say to his father that he wished his body to be clean for a woman to see. He hurried out, carrying the tub to his own room. The door was hung loosely upon a warped wooden frame and did not shut closely, and the old man tottered into the middle room and put his mouth to the opening and bawled. It will be ill if we start the woman like this. Tea in the morning water and all this washing. It is only one day, shouted Wang Lung, and then he added, I will throw the water on the earth when I am finished and it is not all waste. The old man was silent at this and Wang Lung unfastened his girdle and stepped out of his clothing. In the light that streamed in a square block from the hole, he wrung a small towel from the steaming water, and he scrubbed his dark, slender body vigorously. Then he went to a box that had been his mother's and drew from it a fresh suit of blue cotton cloth. He might be a little cold this day without the winter garments but he suddenly could not bear to put them on against his clean flesh. The covering of them was torn and filthy. He did not want this woman to see him for the first time with the wadding stick out of his clothes. Later she would have to wash and mend, but not the first day. He drew over the blue cotton coat and trousers a long robe made of the same material, his one long robe which he wore on feast days only. Then with swift fingers, he unplaited the long braid of hair that hung down his back and taking a wooden comb from the drawer of the small unsteady table, he began to comb out his hair. His father drew near again and put his mouth to the crack of the door. Am I to have nothing to eat this day? He complained. At my age, the bones are water in the morning until food is given them. I am coming, said Wang Long, braiding his hair quickly and smoothly and weaving into the strands a tasseled black silk cord. Then, after a moment, he removed his long gown and wound his braid about his head and went out, carrying the tub of water. He had quite forgotten the breakfast. He would stir a little water into cornmeal and give it to his father. For himself, he could not eat. He staggered with the tub to the threshold, then poured the water upon the earth nearest the door. And as he did so, he remembered he had used all the water in the cauldron for his bathing, and he would have to start the fire again. A wave of anger passed over him at his father. That old head thinks of nothing except his eating and his drinking. He muttered into the mouth of the oven, but aloud he said nothing. 
It was the last morning he would have to prepare food for the old man. He put a very little water into the cauldron, drawing it in a bucket from the well near the door, and it boiled quickly, and he stirred meal together and took it to the old man. We will have rice this night, my father, he said. Meanwhile, here is corn. There is only a little rice left in the basket, said the old man, seating himself at the table in the middle room and stirring with his chopsticks the thick yellow gruel. Wang Lung went into his own room then and drew about him again the long blue robe and let down the braid of his hair. He passed his hand over his shaven brow and over his cheeks. Perhaps he had better he newly shaven. He could pass through the street of the barbers and be shaved before he went to the house where the woman waited for him. If he had the money, he would do it. He took from his girdle a small greasy pouch of gray cloth and counted the money in it. There were six silver dollars and a double handful of copper coins. He had not yet told his father he had asked friends to sup that night. He had asked his male cousin, the young son of his uncle, and his uncle for his father's sake, and three neighboring farmers who lived in the village with him. He had planned to bring back from the town that morning pork, a small pond fish, and a handful of chestnuts. He might even buy a few of the bamboo sprouts from the south and a little beef to stew with the cabbage he had raised in his own garden. But this only if there were any money left after the bean oil and the soybean sauce had been bought. If he shaved his head, he could not perhaps buy the beef. Well, he would shave his head, he decided suddenly. He left the old man without a speech and went out into the early morning. In spite of the dark red dawn, the sun was mounting the horizon clouds and sparkled upon the dew on the rising wheat and barley. The farmer in Wang Long was diverted for an instant, and he stooped to examine the budding heads. They were empty as yet and waiting for the rain. He smelled the air and looked anxiously at the sky. Rain was there, dark in the clouds, heavy upon the wind. He would buy a stick of incense and place it in the little temple to the earth god. On a day like this, he would do it. He wound his way in among the fields upon the narrow path. In the near distance, the great city wall arose. Within that gate, in the wall through which he would pass, stood the great house where the woman had been a slave girl since her childhood, the house of Huang. There were those who said, it is better to live alone than to marry a woman who has been slave in a great house. But when he had said to his father, Am I never to have a woman? His father replied, With weddings costing as they do in these evil days, and every woman wanting gold rings and silk clothes before she will take a man, there remain only slaves to be had for the poor. His father had stirred himself then and gone to the house of Huang and asked if there were a slave to spare. Not a slave too young and above all, not a pretty one, he had said. Wang Lung had suffered because she must not be pretty. It would have been something to have had a pretty wife that other men would congratulate him upon having. His father, seeing his mutinous face, cried out at him, and what will we do with a pretty woman? We must have a woman who will tend the house and bear children as she works in the fields. And will a pretty woman do these things? She will be forever thinking about clothes to go with her face. No, not a pretty woman in our house. We are farmers. Moreover, who has heard of a pretty slave who was virgin in a wealthy house? All the young lords have had their fill of her. It is better to be first with an ugly woman than the hundredth with a beauty. Do you imagine a pretty woman will think your farmer's hands as pleasing as the soft hands of a rich man's son, and your sun black face as beautiful as the golden skin of the others who have had her for their pleasure? 
Wang Long knew his father spoke well, and then he said violently, At least I will not have a woman who is pockmarked or who has a split upper lip. We will have to see what is to be had, his father replied. Well, the woman was not pockmarked, nor had she a split upper lip. This much he knew, but nothing more. He and his father had bought two silver rings, washed with gold and silver earrings, and these his father had taken to the woman's owner in acknowledgment of betrothal. Beyond this, he knew nothing of the woman who was to be his, except that on this day he could go and get her. He walked into the cool darkness of the city gate. Water carriers just outside their barrows laden with great tubs of water passed to and fro all day, the water splashing out of the tubs upon the stones. It was always wet and cool in the tunnel of the gate under the thick wall of earth and brick, cool even upon a summer's day, so that the melon vendors spread their fruits upon the stones. There were none yet, for the season was too early, but baskets of small, hard, green peaches stood along the walls, and the vendors cried out, The first peaches of spring! The first peaches! Buy, eat, purge your bowels of the poisons of winter! Wang Long said to himself, If she likes them, I will buy her a handful when we return. He could not realize that when he walked back through the gate, there would be a woman walking behind him. He turned to the right within the gate and after a moment was in the street of barbers. There were few before him so early, only some farmers who had carried their produce into the town the night before in order that they might sell their vegetables at the dawn markets and return for the day's work in the fields. They had slept shivering and crouching over their baskets the baskets now empty at their feet. Wang Lung avoided them lest some recognize him, for he wanted none of their joking on this day. All down the street, in a long line, the barbers stood behind their small stalls. Wang Lung went to the farthest one and sat down upon the stool and motioned to the barber who stood chattering to his neighbor. The barber came at once and began quickly to pour hot water from a kettle on his pot of charcoal into his brass basin. Shave everything, he said in a professional tone. My head and my face, replied Wang Long. Ears and nostrils cleaned, asked the barber. How much will that cost extra, asked Wang Long cautiously. Four pence, said the barber, beginning to pass a black cloth in and out of the hot water. I'll give you two, said Wang Long. Then I will clean one ear and one nostril, rejoined the barber promptly. On which side of the face do you wish I it done? He grimaced at the next barber as he spoke, and the other burst into a guffaw. Wang Lang perceived that he had fallen into the hands of a joker, and feeling inferior in some unaccountable way, as he always did, to these town dwellers, even though they were only barbers and the lowest of persons, he said quickly, as you will, as you will. Then he submitted himself to the barber's soaping and rubbing and shaving, and being after all a generous fellow enough, the barber gave him without extra charge a series of skillful poundings upon his shoulders and back to loosen his muscles. He commented upon Wang Long as he shaved his upper forehead. This would not be a bad-looking farmer if he would cut off his hair. The new fashion is to take off the braid. His razor hovered so near the circle of hair upon Wang Lung's crown that Wang Lung cried out, I cannot cut it off without asking my father. And the barber laughed and skirted the round spot of hair. When it was finished and the money counted into the barber's wrinkled, water-soaked hand, Wang Lung had a moment of horror. So much money, but walking down the street again, with the wind fresh upon his shaven skin, he said to himself, it is only once. He went to the market then and bought two pounds of pork and watched the butcher 
as he wrapped it in a dried lotus leaf and then hesitating, he bought also six ounces of beef. When all had been bought, even two fresh squares of bean curd, shivering in the jelly upon its leaf, he went to a candle maker's shop, and there he bought a pair of incense sticks. Then he turned his steps with great shyness toward the house of Wang. Once at the gate of the house, he was seized with terror. How had he come alone? He should have asked his father, his uncle, even his nearest neighbor, Ching, anyone to come with him. He had never been in a great house before. How could he go in with his wedding feast on his arm and say, I have come for a woman? He stood at the gate for a long time looking at it. It was closed fast, two great wooden gates painted black and bound and studded with iron, closed upon each other. Two lines made of stone stood on guard, one at either side. There was no one else. He turned away. It was impossible. He felt suddenly faint. He would go first and buy a little food. He had eaten nothing, had forgotten food. He went into a small street restaurant and putting two pence upon the table, he sat down. A dirty waiting boy with a shiny black apron came near and he called out to him two bowls of noodles. And when they were come, he ate them down greedily, pushing them into his mouth and with his bamboo chopsticks. Will you have more? asked the boy indifferently. Wang Lung shook his head. He sat up and looked about. There was no one he knew in the small, dark, crowded room full of tables. Only a few men sat eating or drinking tea. It was a place for poor men, and among them he looked neat and clean and almost well-to-do, so that a beggar passing whined at him, Have a good heart, teacher, and give me a small cash. I starve. Wang Lung had never had a beggar ask him before, nor had any even called him teacher. He was pleased, and he threw into the beggar's bowl two small cash, which are one-fifth of a penny. And the beggar pulled back with swiftness, his black claw of a hand, and grasping the cash, fumbled them within his rag. Wang Lung sat, and the sun climbed upwards. The waiting boy lounged about impatiently. If you are buying nothing more, he said at last with much impudence, you will have to pay rent for the stool. Wang Lung was incensed at such impudence and he would have risen except that when he thought of going into the great house of Wang and of asking there for a woman, sweat broke out over his whole body as though he were working in a field. Bring me tea, he said weakly to the boy. Before he could turn, it was there, and the small boy demanded sharply, Where is the penny? And Wang Lung, to his horror, found there was nothing to do but to produce from his girdle yet another penny. It is robbery, he muttered unwillingly. Then he saw entering the shop his neighbor, whom he had invited to the feast, and he put the penny hastily upon the table and drank the tea at a gulp and went out quickly by the side door and was once more upon the street. It is to be done, he said to himself desperately and slowly he turned his way to the great gates.